So, is this it? You're a gardener now? Those were Greg's words. Now, before I start, I'll ask, are you one of the odd ones out in life? Have you ever been one of those people who feels like you don't know your place in the world? Have you ever been at a party or a nightclub or on a lad's holiday or a Liverpool hen do or your classmates join eighth birthday party at Mega Ball? And while everyone else is playing beer pong, dropping Jaeger bombs, chanting Premiership, you're having a laugh, maniacally applauding a pink pinata penis, or chewing bits of Colin the Caterpillar with open mouths in the way eight-year-olds do, have you had the outer body experience of, I don't belong here? Let me take you back to six years ago. I'm working two different part-time retail jobs that while I don't necessarily dislike individually, I loathe when combined. And it's my fault, not theirs. I don't know what I'm doing with my life or where it's going or what I'm aiming for. I live in a north facing city centre flat with a relentless stream of awful neighbours and bizarre, traumatising, sometimes violent street activity. Something's grating and it's the grittiness that I always thought of as pure poetry that I am now sick of. My living room window is the frame to a messed up oil painting of drug overdoses, glassings, and the same old Saturday night rows because someone danced with someone else in bar 11. I am sick of the sight of grey concrete and bloody noses. I've just handed the keys back to the premises of my first failed business and all of my friends seem to be getting married or having babies or completing PhDs and I don't know what the fuck I'm meant to be doing. Actually, no. That was all getting a bit too indulgent. Let's just fast forward all the way to the end point of this story. It's my 30th birthday. And I'm sat in the middle of the strawberry patch at my allotment, absolutely smashed on Prosecco, picking ripe strawberries off the plants that I nurtured and cackling at my friend's drunken stories about how Matthew in finance and operations liked and unliked one of her Instagram photos at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. Now, before I continue, I should probably start again by saying that this is not a story about gardening or nature or the varying hues and hardiness of plants in their natural environment. No, this is a story about how I spent my 30th birthday completely and joyfully drunk at my allotment surrounded by nine empty bottles and seven people. And that's six bottles of Prosecco, one bottle of champagne and a bottle of Carver. I thought I'd bring Carver, Hannah said, as she pulled it out of her knockoff Fjell Raven bag. Because everyone always brings Prosecco, don't they? Um, where's the toilet? Someone else asked when they arrived. Well, I said, it's wherever you want it to be. Behind the shed's a good spot. But back to six years ago, when I was working two different part-time jobs, and they were contributing to my having a nervous breakdown purely because of the irrational ideals that I had imagined for my life as a graduate bohemian artist, poet, traveller. My hair was falling out. I was shutting down. And I wholeheartedly thought, I must be ill. But that's the problem summed up. Far, far, far too much thinking. So I put my name down for an allotment plot. And as soon as I found one, signed my contract and first handed over some real actual money to buy someone else's horse's real actual manure, I stopped thinking at all. In those first few months I was there six hours a day, I'd do no thinking all week. In those hours, weeding, pruning, pulling, gradually it became eight hours a week. But it depends how much thinking I don't want to do or how many frogs I'm worried will be stuck to the side of a dried out pond on a hot day. Six years ago, I was at my Nana and Bob's house, 
silently, stressfully shedding hair all over their carpet. Thinking I was too young for anything so serious to happen to me. Thinking I was too old to get started with a new career in a new town or a new identity. Thinking far too much. A macabre facade of a woman who was trying too hard. What time are you off home, Jodie? Do not let it get too late or your man won't want you going back in the dark. Our estate ain't like yours, you know. You want me to ring you a taxi? Here you are, it's 20 quid. Don't go get in that bloody bus. Bob handed me a note from his pocket, but my phone started to ring. It was my boss, Pam. Hi, Pam. Uh, okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, I can cover Emma's Thursday and Friday. Oh, God, that's awful. Oh, that's so sad. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, bye. I hung up. Someone's dead, Bob asked. Um, sort of. A girl at work's had a miscarriage. Oh, right. What? And she wants you to work her shifts? Bob said, picking up a carving he was working on. A timber self-portrait. A tall, thin, elderly man wearing a flat cap and a tracksuit. Have you got that allotment yet? Yeah, can I take some cuttings from your garden? Because I've not got many plants yet, I said. We used to have half a carrot on a stick for a treat when we was younger. My nana said. My father used to give us a spoonful of smash, that smash, for dinner on a night. Bob's dad had everything growing in his back garden. I tell you bloody summer, you wouldn't know it was the war around their end. Oh, I Bob piped in. He used to grow apples and pears on the same tree. Non-stop spuds, beautiful strawberries, all herbs and that. We was never hungry. Honest to God, I'm not kidding you. Apples and pears on the same tree. Bob said this as he lit himself and my nana a cigarette. Do you know, I am bloody brilliant at gardening. Especially growing stuff from cuttings. I used to go to these fancy garden centres where no one can afford now. You can pick a flower head off one of these fancy fuchsias and then I'd put that in my mouth to keep it wet. I'd keep it there all the bus home and then I'd be growing that into a massive plant. If there's one thing I got from my dad, it was his green thumb. Have you seen all my mint back there? Go and help yourself. I'm bloody fantastic at growing. He picked his carving back up. That's the one thing I'm really chuffed about, that I got my dad's green thumb. I took a sip of Panda Pop lemonade that was foisted on me and walked through to the kitchen where the back door was blowing open and shut behind a butcher's strip curtain. The view was that never-ending stream of rows and rows of small windowed council houses and weather-beaten washing lines that make up the now natural landscape of the urban north. Beyond the back door was this tiny terrace garden, a solid square jungle of unadulterated, overgrown mint. Oh, and a Humpty Dumpty statue with acid rain bubbled eyes and fossilised bird shit on its head. I grabbed a fistful of mint stalks and went back inside. But several years later, I am sat on the strawed and cold soil of my strawberry patch, smothered by perennial fennels, with a gradually dampening bum and a bottle of wine in my blood, that's half Prosecco, half Carver. And I'm staring drunkenly, joyfully, regretfully, at the metre tall, eternally infiltrating jungle of mint that I planted directly into the soil as that small fistful of mint stalks, even though all the books and neighbours told me not to. Always put mint in a pot. Oh, I wish I knew someone who liked mojitos. On my 30th birthday, Salvatore popped his head over the grapevines. The ones he planted 20 years before brought us cuttings from his mum's house in Italy, probably. This was before he moved to the plot next to mine that was his father-in-law's before that. What are you up to, Doc? You getting pissed up? You want some spinach plants? A couple of hours later, I'm trying to crank the volume of Susie and the Banshees through a phone speaker whilst getting a bonfire going and trying to find the best chunks of wood to give to Hannah to throw on it. This is so great, isn't it? Like, women just getting on and doing this kind of stuff, she said. 
a woman, I thought, me, I did it. There are a hundred cucumbers here because of me. There's 200 frogs here because of me. There's 5,000 slugs here because of me. There's an infestation of biting spiders in our flat's coat cupboard because of me. There's also probably an unwanted and never going to be in bag of Russian red kale in one of my friend's fridges right now, ruining their olfactory ambience because of me. When the sun had almost set, the various people in my life were sat in different sections of my loving labours and toils, drinking pink gin and trying to pick out the unwashed and soggy mint leaves that I'd shoved into their glasses. I was alone, in the corner by the bonfire pile, barefoot on ashy ground, throwing bits of old wood and garden magazines onto the flames and poking the sparks with my new birthday present off my allotment neighbour Robin. A Sheffield steel scythe. My allotment is a graveyard. Almost everyone's is. Dig around enough and you're bound to find a dog collar from 1989 somewhere under the raspberry canes. One day, when Robin and me are long gone, dead or moved on, someone will probably dig around Buddy. We laid him in bare soil, cold soft fur touching cold clay mud. I think he may already be in the trunk of the fig tree by now just his collar and brass tag left. My name is Buddy and I'm lost. Please call my owner. Maybe he'll be discovered in 50 years time by somebody who doesn't like figs. But who doesn't like figs? People who have never tried a fresh, ripe, organic, homegrown fig, that's who. And did I mention the rat? Yep, there's a rat there somewhere. I planted that one by myself. Buried it rather. I think he died of heat exhaustion in my greenhouse. I felt intensely guilty about that. I put him in two feet of bare soil too. My only ever met dead friend returning back to the earth, assimilating into the asters. I mentioned this event to my pest controller dad who just messaged back, Jodie, you're gonna get wheels disease. I'm getting a wheel made up this week. I'm not married and I don't want to leave all the decision making for my death to my mother if I go before her. She'll be an M the whole service up. There'll be a diamante velour frilled pillow with the words sleep tight embroidered on it, cries into my pale stiff fingers. I can't have it. So I'm getting my will made up and it's quite simple really. Give all the cash to Greg. Let my niece have my pink silk vintage poochie jacket. Offer what's in my greenhouse to Robin and bury me under my strawberry patch. Don't bother telling council, there'll only be red tape. And anyway, everybody likes strawberries. Yeah, I'm a gardener now. There's something about muck under my fingernails that feels rebellious, transgressive even. The mess of it all. Seed pods in my hair from the goose grass that leaves red welts at my arm. Crumbs of dusty mud that fall from my wrist as I take off my watch. Water running chocolate tears when I wash my hands. Freckles smudged with soil. I like to consider the ways women over the years have made their mark, raised their soprano voices above the baritones. It occurs to me that the land has for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, been the place where our stories have taken seed in the crushing of garlic leaves into cup and ring marks high up in the Northumbrian wilds, in the collection of herbs for healing, in the preparation of vegetables, the picking of fruit, all the time caring and coping, nourishing and nurturing, our stories seeping into the soil, bubbling on the stove, evaporating with the steam. Picking apples. The best way to pick an apple is to cup it in the palm of your hand Lift it up, then give it a gentle twist until it comes away. Each apple should detach complete with its stalk. My mum has an aspidistra that sits on the windowsill in her lounge. It used to belong to my great granny, Irene. Rini was born in Derby in 1902. I wonder if the aspidistra belonged to her mum before that. They were very popular in gloomy Victorian parlours, so it's possible that this plant first took root in the 19th century. Aspidistras are sometimes called cast iron plants because they're impossible to kill. 
and this is backed up by Mum's description of the happy neglect her own Aspidistra has enjoyed. Rini worked as a domestic cook before she married Bert, who worked at the local tax office. They had two children. Her tales are all sewn into her tapestries, needle in, needle out, stitching unspoken words into pictures that now hang on my wall. Towards the end of her life, Rini moved in with her daughter, Gillian, my granny. The house that they shared was on a corner plot. My granny enjoyed growing vegetables, runner beans that we'd eat with her homemade fish pie. I have the Royal Dalton dish that she baked the fish pie in. Now I fill it with cooked rhubarb from my own allotment or stewed apples twisted from the branches by my daughter's tiny hands. Then I crumble sugary flour onto the top and cook until it caramelises. When I think of Granny in her navy blue slacks and short sleeved shirt kneeling over the veg beds, I wonder now how much of her heart she was pouring into the earth. Whether she was having conversations in her head with the husband she'd loved and lost too soon, or contemplating the treatment she had for breast cancer not long after he died. Did she shake the soil from the potatoes, rub them smooth, wash them clean with the same care she used with my grandpa? Because all that love doesn't suddenly go away, it has to go somewhere. She was always caring, my granny, for her children, for her husband, and then for her mum. But who was caring for her? I wonder if, when she placed her hands in the cool damp of the soil, she felt small, like I do. I wonder if her worries felt less in those moments, if her place in the world felt assured and steady. I hope so. There was a lovely lady, Lexi, who helped to care for Rini while Granny was at work, and a white cat, Tom. I remember sitting in an upright chair with my great Granny while she flicked through a catalogue and oohed and aahed at the male models, and feeling lucky that I still had a Granny who was great. On the day of Rini's funeral, my little brother caught his finger in the garden gate and the end came off. I remember my mum fishing around in the bin trying to find it amongst all the blood and kitchen roll so the doctors could stick it back on. Mum missed the funeral, which was sad, but that's kids for you. Rini's Aspidistra is over a hundred years old and its roots have been handled by generation after generation, split over and over and shared with love. Propagation. Hold plant firmly at the base. Gently remove from the pot and shake any excess soil. Use your fingers to loosen the root ball, then take a sharp knife and cut into sections. Pot up these new divisions and share them freely with friends and family. My other granny, Mary Pearl, likes to arrange flowers. Her elegant fingers stroke the long lengths of carnations, chrysanthemums and cornflowers as her milky eyes scan the outlines of the petals. She used to spin like a whirlwind around the kitchen, sauces bubbling on the stove, a joint of beef roasting in the oven. Once she spilled a pan of gravy all over the floor. Oh fuck, I've dropped the lot, she exhaled in her cut glass accent. She's still an excellent swearer, but now the whirlwind has taken root in her muddled mind. Some days she's about to attend a wedding and simply must find the right hat. Other days she's on the boat that took her to India, where my dad was born. She always remembers the two huge Wellingtonia trees that flanked the house she lived in so many years ago. On happier days, living in the past feels like home. But on the days when everyone's face is a mystery, there's very little that can soothe her. The act of placing a vase in front of her, spreading stems out on the table, trimming them snip, 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 just as she likes, and popping them in the water, brings her close to calm. The delicately corrugated petals of a carnation are something she can lose herself in. Flower arranging. There are seven main principles of floral design. Proportion, scale, harmony, rhythm, balance, emphasis, and unity. When these basic flower arranging rules are understood and used correctly, you can create gorgeous floral arrangements. I feel closely connected with spider plants the way their babies hang from my bookshelves. Spider plants used to sway from the ceiling in macrame plant holders all over the cottage where I grew up. You can remove the babies, soak them in water until the roots start to dangle down. The delicate and vulnerable at this baby stage need constant attention and care. My own babies are not yet at the stage where they can be propagated, 
They still hang from my neck, drape themselves under my arms, cling on tightly to my waist. Attachment theory. The central theme of attachment theory is that primary caregivers who are available and responsive to an infant's needs allow the child to develop a sense of security. The infant knows that the caregiver is dependable, which creates a secure base for the child to then explore the world. Spider plant babies are quicker to manage their independence than the human equivalents. Underneath the claustrophobia though, there's something lovely about being needed. Friends with older children tell me that propagation leads to something called empty nest syndrome, which I'm not in a hurry to experience. House plants feel like reliable friends, part of my family's furniture. They are needy in their own way too. There's a transference there that shifts the energy in the house. Tiny acts that punctuate the day, wiping dust from a waxy leaf, softly pressing the soil to check if it's still damp, filling any old container from the bathroom tap and pouring water around the stems. Brief moments that turn the focus away from me, slow down my brain as I imagine the plants breathing little sighs of relief and swivelling their faces to the light. But I find the real remedy in my allotment, a beautiful mess that mirrors the contradictions I feel in my own life, the viciousness of thistles that refuse to be tamed but whose purple crowns make me swoon, a jab in the face from the branch of my plum tree, the plump sheen of its fruit swaying in the corner of my eye, creeping buttercup invading my space but its golden flowers too pretty to tear up. Allotment Rules Keep the plot free of weeds and in good condition. Do not use the allotment for the purpose of any trade or business. Do not cause any nuisance or annoyance to the occupiers of other allotments or obstruct any path. Do not sublet the plot or build any structures without the written consent of the landlord. Once I've handed over my yearly rent to the Duke, I don't think about what I must not do. I relish the freedom I can enjoy. So much of a woman's life is spent being tidy, putting on a neat and acceptable show, turning up at the school gate with a fixed smile, trying not to be visible on a dark street, being praised for how we look rather than how we think or what we do, apologising for breathing. The rebellion is the imperfection. It doesn't matter how neat my borders are, how spotless my flower beds, there will always be dirt under my nails. Escaping, emerging, encompassing, encouraging, expanding, enjoying, emboldening, educating, edifying, encountering, sprouting, shading, spreading, shaping, staining, scenting, soaking, swaying. We planted lemon pips in flower pots. One lemon's worth was how we started off. My faith was too weak, too weary, too lost. So we added more, pressed into the compost. We ended up with 64 of them. Soon we were up to our ankles in stems, all germinating in the ancient porch, a tiny lemon forest at the door. We began giving lemon trees away, carrying them with care to the school gate, pressing one upon every visitor, stowing them away beneath friends' pushchairs. Now installed in halls and kitchen windows, we hope our lockdown lemon trees still grow. Digging, dancing, Dazzling, dying, decomposing, decaying, budding, blossoming, bursting, blowing, withering, weeding. This house once belonged to a lady who loved pink. Pink carpets, pink curtains, pink paint on the anaglypta, pink bathroom suite. Our mission is to eradicate the pink. 
except in the garden. Here, pink and flowery is in its rightful place. Snapdragons, fuchsia, camellia and frilled tulip, potentilla, peony, geraniums and snowberry, pink-stemmed rhubarb and pink-blossomed medlar, flowering currant, climbing jasmine, pink flowering berberis, pink-tipped pyrus, clematis and hyacinth. The pink lady's plants are a permanent feature, a pink inheritance. Accommodating, collecting, climbing, competing, feeding, flowering, fruiting, falling, fading. What if the opposite of remembering is dismembering? If each time we revisit the stories of our lives, we reassemble them slightly differently. Each retelling becomes the daughter of the last remembering. Our memories birthing new generations, cycling in seasons, like the reseeding aquilegia that returns each year the whites and purples sprouting variously around the flower buds. What if remembering is a creative forgetting? The memory of grandparents arriving, flower laden, of my parents taking them to look around the garden, of conversation coloured with care instructions, of the provenance of various potted cuttings, superseding the mundanity of grown-up greetings, descriptions of roadworks and tailbacks on the M4, the language of motorways, junctions and slip roads, the litany of service stations. Now we rehearse the same ritual with my parents, who clamber from the car with a tray of lavender plugs, or bring their old biscuit tin full of seeds in envelopes so the children can grow vegetables in our garden, siblings of the ones that fill their allotment back at home. Seeds passed from hand to hand, like connections on a family tree. What if plants can stand in for people in our memory garden? Whenever I see cyclamen for sale, I remember the ones from Grandma, planted out too late in that first rented garden, which the frost carried away without a trace. Red roses were Grandad Reg's favourites, so each of our gardens has one blooming each summer in remembrance. Gran and Grandpa grew gladioli and iris in their Guernsey greenhouses, Gran kneeling on the cushion of an old car seat, pushing four bulbs into each square of the soil Grandpa had marked out with string. The cut stems packed in boxes in the cold shed before being taken to England and sold. Forsythia came as a cutting from my mother-in-law as well as potentilla and a clump of lily of the valley, brought round, freshly dug from their front beds. From my dad's garden came Michaelmas daisies, anemone, primrose, allium and phlox. The flower beds are filling with a half-remembered song. Mum found all the self-seeded sprigs of Cotoneaster and made the beginnings of a new border. For Christmas, in the time of coronavirus, we got yellow rose bushes by special delivery. Family is arranged in flower beds in the memory garden, in-laws jostling with each other, extending their leaves as they stake their claim to the soil. We make our own memories here too, the lockdown experiments with the children, the place by the plum tree where we planted salad leaves, the seeds posted up in bubble wrap by mum and dad, the heaped earth in the corner for the potatoes gone to seed, the inherited flower pots now camouflaged with strawberries, the place where the single purple tulip bloomed, only to be plucked by a preschooler's hands, the solitary sunflower brought home from nursery. Later they will forget the flowers themselves, whether it was a tulip picked or a daffodil or a marigold remembering only the story that got told and retold. Leaning, 
leaving, languishing, leading, lengthening, liberating, living, rooting, rambling, retreating, relaxing, reviving, returning, readying, releasing, rescuing, <laughs>